updated. It's just that data will no longer be provided. With that, I'd like to thank you all for joining today's session and thank the entire NRH team, the Vitsal Consortium team involved in organizing the sessions and to our panelists. And um, once again, thank you to all the speakers who previously presented. And I wish you a productive session. Be well and do stay safe. I'll hand you over to our program director, Mr. Ashraf Raikliff, who will take you through the rest of the proceedings and uh, give you a few housekeeping rules. Thanks, over to you, Ashraf. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Tanusha Singh, who's the head of the NIH's COVID-19 outbreak response team, also overseeing all these Zoom online training webinars uh, dealing with the various topics on COVID-19. And uh, she also heads on a full-time basis the immunology and microbiology section of the National Institute for Occupational Health. Um, at this point, I'm going to uh, introduce the representative from the WITS Health Consortium. Um, and uh, uh, Ms. Janine Roper is going to represent, uh, as, uh, as the training manager of the WITS Health Consortium, um, Janine Roper is going to represent the WITS Health Consortium today. So over to you, Janine. Thank you, Ashraf. Thank you very much. Um, to everyone that's um, on the line today, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just want to firstly echo our sentiments um, with Tunesh. Um, our relationship in terms of the training interventions that have taken place has been extremely fruitful and our hope is that there has been learning and there will be further learning that takes place as we go ahead. Um, I just want to also extend a special thank you to the Health and Welfare CETA for actually giving us the funding in order for us to have these training sessions and for making this possible. Um, and from Vitzel Consortium, I just want to thank the NIH team for all their hard work um, and for putting in the endless hours to make all of this possible. From our side, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our speakers that we've had over the last few months. And I hope that you guys enjoy the session today and it's fruitful. Thank you, Ashraf and team. So thank you very, thank you very much for that, Janine. Janine is the training manager at the Wit South Consortium, and today is representing the WHC um, as part of our welcome and introduction. Thank you very much for that, Janine. So to have just in a, a moment ago shared with you the program, and I'm going to do that again. Um, I just need to get all my controls sorted here when you've got too many windows open. Um, one needs to just make sure that everything is sorted. So I'm sharing the screen again and I'm going to deal with a few quick um, housekeeping matters um, and to give you some important contact uh, numbers and details in order for you to be able to have the right information. So you should be seeing the program again. and. Um, I think that the program is probably, if I can just move this slightly out of my way, there we go. Um, okay, so I hope the program is filling the full screen there on your side. Um, and so, yeah, you can see that we've had the welcome by Dr. Tanusha Singh, who's also heading our COVID-19 uh, outbreak response team and the head of the immunology and microbiology section. Um, Ms. Janine Roper on behalf of the Wits Health Consortium, the training manager. Um, and then uh, we are going to have a series of presenters, presentations. Um, in this case, we are going to, we've asked and consulted our presenters and they said that since it's a repeat session, the previous presentations are perfect and they would ask to, want us to proceed with that. So my colleague Glenn is going to be instrumental in helping us with regard to that. As well as uh, the, that's the medical screening for COVID-19 by Dr. Sayuri Pillay, who is uh, from the WITS School for Public Health, um, as well as the NIH based here at uh, the N N National Institute for Occupational Health. That's followed by the presentation by Sister Ida Jordan, who is based at the NICD, that's the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, our sister institute within the National Health Laboratory Services. Uh, she is um, based and situated um, as part of our SHE department 
which is also located here on our Bramfordden campus. She will deal with contact tracing, reporting, and notification. Then Dr. Nick van der Water, um, who is a, in private practice as an occupational medical practitioner, he, uh, he dealt with quarantine and isolation, the business continuity plans in the light of COVID-19 pandemic. And then the uh, remuneration for COVID-19 related employee absence from work was dealt with by Dr. Jan Lapierre. And this doctor is not just an occupational medical practitioner and specialist, but also a qualified um, legal um, person, um, lawyer. And so very well qualified to deal with all those aspects that deals with issues of leave and the different types of leave and so on. For those of you, like myself, who was unsure about that matter, that's a very uh, important topic to deal with also before we close. So that's the program. A bit of um, housekeeping, and I'm not sure if you can... Um, okay, so I would need to probably move it here. I suspect that you're still seeing um, part of my slides, and I have not been looking at the chat group, uh, chat box to see if you had brought it to my attention. Okay, right. There are some questions already being asked about sharing presentations. I will answer that now with the virtual housekeeping matters. So, okay, I can see that this is not being shared in full screen. So, um, let me um, try this. This tends to happen to me, you know, when Murphy's Law doesn't work, want to work with me. Um, so I'm going to just reduce that side there. I'm sure that's much better. Okay, so firstly, uh, certificates of attendance is made available. Um, and, uh, and at the moment, in terms of our partnership with the Wits Health Consortium, uh, those certificates of attendance are being generated by our colleagues who's part of the WHC admin team. And the email address is the HWS training at witshealth.co.za. That is HWS training at witshealth.co.za. Um, that's where you can direct uh, your communications. For CPD related matters, it's our, the info at nih.ac.za. Um, that's where you can email those, those particular aspects. This slide deals with the CPD matters. And it has been um, uh, uh, flashing on your uh, screen before we started at half past 10. And I will put that um, uh, uh, repeat slideshow on again when we stop at half past 12. And the professional bodies are dealt with there. Uh, there is one aspect that I, was, I had to add here that this happens within a 24 hour cycle after the webinar is done, because there are some post webinar administration to be done in order to get this link through to you. So please do not email us immediately after the webinar. You, you are just going to block and fill up the mailbox, the inbox, which is already pretty full. Okay, so the next slide is the question about presentations. Somebody asked that just now in the chat group and Access to all of the presentations, as Dr. Singh, Dr. Tanusha Singh has indicated earlier, is available on the NIH website, right? So the video and audio recordings, the presentations, the posters, and so on. Um, it's the links are there. Some of the documents are directly there for download, and some of them are links maybe to our YouTube channel. But our website is zero rated as indicated, and therefore when you go there, all the cell phone service providers indicated here at the bottom will not be charging you data if you go to the NIH website. And the other routes to get information to us, uh, from us, or to ask us any questions that might not be covered in the webinar in the two-hour period is our email address, info at nih.ac.za. Please follow us on Twitter. That's Twitter. Uh, that's at NIH underscore SA, at NIH underscore essay, as well as for the urgent calls, please, urgent, not administration, please do not call this number for any certificates or CPD related or any other complaints about, you know, the link to this webinar, etc., or the quality of the sound and so on. This is for urgent calls, and that's our hotline, 8080021275. 08002175. And then just to 
conclude, uh, we do have quite a large numbers of people that do log in. Your microphones and video feed are muted because we cannot engage in a, a sort of dialogue to, uh, uh, both ways. It will be unmanageable. Please use the question and answer function. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you are going to see that there is a question and answer bubble, the two speech bubbles. That's where you type your questions. Please, no comments there, no other questions with regard to uh, certificates or CPD points, only questions related to the content. We have a team of panelists ready to answer your questions. And then finally, general comments, saying hi to each other, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is in the chat function, and that's sometimes where I also post links to our website and other announcements with regard to what I've just shared with you. Okay, so again, um, uh, back to the program. We are now going to hand you back over to um, our colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Sayuri Pillay's input and presentation. And I'm gonna ask Glenn while I unshare the screen um, to just prepare that for you. Uh, so Dr. Sayuri Pillay, as you've seen, um, is uh, both a joint um, representative of the Witt School of Public Health as well as the National Institute for Occupational Health and is currently situated in our occupational medicine section um, headed by um, my, our colleague uh, um, Busi, Dr. Busi, and then um, she will deal with the medical screening for COVID-19 in her presentation. So I'm going to ask Glenn just to assist us there. Okay, so Sorry. while that's happening, again, thank you. Um, hi, uh, everyone. While that's Good happening. Morning. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Sayuri Pillay. I am a WITS Public Health Registrar uh, currently at NIOH. So I'm going to be doing a presentation on medical screening in the workplace. So what is medical screening? Screening refers to the use of simple tests across an apparently healthy population in order to identify individuals who have risk factors or early stages of disease, but who may not yet have symptoms. This is according to the WHO. So in the case of COVID-19, it refers to the process of checking a person's temperature and asking a series of questions related to certain symptoms associated with the disease. You're trying to uh, find potential cases of COVID-19. According to the DEL, which is the Department of Employment and Labor, measures for the daily screening of employees and workers and clients, contractors and visitors to the workplace must be included in the workplace risk assessment and carried out. Please note, this is so important, screening is not a replacement for the preventative measures in the workplace. Control measures are extremely important and need to be followed in the work environment. And screening is also not a diagnostic test. So performing screening on your employees is not gonna confirm whether they have disease or not. It identifies people who will require further diagnostic testing for the disease. So why are we screening for COVID-19? It's to ensure early and timeliest identific identification and diagnosis of workers at the risk of COVID-19 infection. It ensures early referral for appropriate treatment, uh, care and timeliest return to work of affected workers. And it ensures the protection of other unaffected workers, consumers, visitors and clients of these groups of workers. So this is just taken from the Government Gazette, the Department of Employment and Labor, released on the 4th of June of this year, under health and safety measures, just to show you that they state that every employer must implement symptom screening in the workplace. So what should already be in place in terms of screening? There should be an allocated screening station uh, for your temperature check and symptom screening uh, questionnaire to take place. The screening sites must be stocked with enough PPE, which includes gloves, sanitizer, face masks, and face shields. Waste bins for disposal of medical waste should be available and clearly marked. Sanitizer use must be encouraged on arrival and exit, and you can do this by having those non-touch uh, sanitizer stands. Tra 
training for all workers on screening must be done. And this can include why, how, uh, and what to do if someone screens positive. And this is really important, so it ensures that everyone is aware of the protocols in place and the policies regarding what to do when they have symptoms and leave. And this should all be included in an SOP, which you should have or think about having. Uh, and this should also include guidelines on how often to screen employees. So according to the South African guidelines, employees should be screened at the start of a shift and prior to ending the shift by a designated person uh, to check if they've had any sudden onset of various symptoms, which we will go through. This is also workplace specific as it depends on the shifts that you have in place. And you should also include in your SOP which employer employees can go to if they need to alert someone if they've experienced any symptoms or a change in symptoms during the day. So who can perform the screening? The screening can be done by any personnel in the workplace who has been adequately trained on the matter and understands what is expected of them and what procedures to follow. This includes knowing how to correctly don PPE if required. They must be trained the screening correctly. They must be aware of what to look for in order to know whether a person is allowed into the workplace or not. And they themselves must be a healthy individual who doesn't fall into the high-risk category and preferably not have high-risk family members at home. So who must be screened? This is everyone. Uh, employees, employers, visitors, and contractors must all be screened before coming into the workplace. How should screening be conducted? You need to obtain consent before screening is commenced, and this is specifically for the temperature screening, as it's a test that you're carrying out on someone. Ensure dignity of the individual is considered, especially if they're screening positive for COVID-19 symptoms. Make sure prevention measures are in place, social distancing and wearing of PPE as required. Encourage honesty when filling out the screening questionnaire form. Avoid stigma related to COVID-19 and symptoms of it. And there should also be an isolation room or area nearby available for individuals who screen positive. So we'll go into symptom screening. So symptom screening is usually done in the form of a checklist or questionnaire that's filled out by all employees and visitors, anyone coming into the workplace. Important details to capture include contact details, reason for the visit, who the person is visiting, and if the person is an employee, which area they work in. You need to know a history of possible symptoms that we'll go through, if there was contact with a confirmed COVID-19 patient, and a declaration stating that all above is true. So important symptoms that have to be included on the questionnaire include a sore throat, cough, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, and a loss of smell or taste in the last 14 days. So these symptoms are specific and they are set out according to the NICD guidelines on the case definition of COVID-19 and looking for a suspect COVID-19 patient. It's important to keep up with the changing guidelines so that you change your screening questionnaire accordingly. Workers and visitors should be made aware of the symptoms so that they don't come to work or to visit if they have them. And this is where the concept of symptom monitoring comes into play. Uh, so this is important and should be encouraged to be done. And it's basically the act of daily monitoring for COVID-19 symptoms. So once the visitor or worker is aware, they can alert the employer from home without putting everyone in the workplace at risk. Honesty of the person filling out the form. A lot comes into play here. Uh, this is where the worker or visitor must feel comfortable enough to be honest when filling out the form. And this is why training is so important. So the more people know, the less fear there is. The more they know about the policies in place surrounding COVID and leave and sick leave, uh, the more honest they should be. This is just taken from the NICD case definition of a person under investigation, just to show you that symptoms include any of the following respiratory symptoms, which is cough, sore throat, shortness of breath, loss of sense of smell or alteration of the sense of taste, 
with or without other symptoms. So this is where your more vague, mild symptoms come in, which is fever, weakness, myalgia, and diarrhea. And they should be included on your symptom questionnaire as well, and we'll go through it in detail. So this is where it comes into play. There's various symptom clusters to look out for. So these symptom clusters, uh, six of them, uh, were found by uh, the BMJ in an article that they released where they took information from a symptom tracker app to distinguish certain groups of symptoms. So an algorithm found these six groups, and these are usual presentations of COVID, but it's important to remember that not everyone will present as one of these clusters. So just going through them, cluster one is flu-like with no fever. So that's a headache, loss of smell, muscle, muscle pains, cough, sore throat, and chest pain. Flu-like with a fever is the above, with a fever, hoarseness, and loss of appetite. Gastrointestinal includes headache, loss of smell, loss of appetite, diarrhea, sore throat, chest pain with no cough. And then clusters four, five, and six are more severe. So these, level one, includes fatigue, headache, loss of smell, cough, fever, hoarseness, and chest pain. Level two is the above with confusion, loss of appetite, muscle pain, sore throat. And level three is abdominal and respiratory uh, involvement, which is basically a combination of all of the symptoms. So with screening in the workplace, you're most likely to see clusters one, two, and three. And those come across as very mild symptoms and vague symptoms that people may not necessarily relate to COVID-19. So those are symptoms that you need to look out for. With symptom screening, we also need to take into consideration what form of screening you're going to use. So there's paper-based and technology screening applications, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. So what you choose depends on your workplace and what's easiest for you. And you need to take into consideration the advantages and disadvantages of each. What one can consider is using technology-based screening for their long-term employees and paper-based screening for visitors. So going through the advantages and disadvantages, paper-based advantages is that it's a well-established standardized system of collecting information. It doesn't rely on technology knowledge or products to use it and it's easy to implement and low cost. The disadvantages, however, is that it's a high admin burden, data loss may occur, it results in a sharing of pens, clipboards, and forms, which puts people at high risk for COVID-19. There's a time burden if uh, the forms are not filled beforehand, and as mentioned, a high paper burden could have a high cost long-term. With technology screening, the advantages is that it's time-saving, there's better data keeping and confidentiality ensured. There's long-term benefits, especially in workplaces with high volumes of constant workers, and there's a low contact risk. The disadvantages, however, is that it's not easily accessible to everyone, as not everyone may have a smartphone or data. It may be deemed not user-friendly by certain staff, and it will require training. So moving on to temperature screening, why is the temperature checked? This is such a common question that we get. So basically, even though a fever is a common symptom of many illnesses and disease, it is noted as an additional symptom of COVID-19. A large majority of the patients who present um, with COVID with fever as one of their symptoms, around 90% of the patients. And when screening, it can be used as a factor to identify potential ill employees who may or may not have COVID. It's also an objective measurement compared to the subject me uh, measurement of the symptom questionnaire. So with this, you can record the temperature and have it there on paper. It's important to note that temperature screening alone will not find all potential cases of COVID. Some staff members may be asymptomatic, some may be in the early stages of disease, their incubation period, so they won't have any symptoms, and some may take medications to reduce fever, therefore masking the symptom. So thermal screening has to be part of a package of measures to prevent and control COVID-19 work in the workplace. It can't be used alone as a screening tool. And as mentioned in the South African guidelines, temperature screening can be used in the workplace if available, 
but remember, it can't be used alone uh, to screen your patients or your individuals. So tools used, you have non-contact thermometers and contact thermometers. So your non-contact thermometers are the ones that are most commonly used to check for a temperature. It reduces the risk of cross-contamination and minimizes the risk of spreading disease. So the one that you see everywhere and that you're probably using in your workplace is a non-contact infrared thermometer. Important to know is that incorrect usage may lead to inaccurate readings. You have thermal scanners, which you can use. These are the ones that are used in airports, for example, for mass crowd screening of people. It promotes physical distancing and is more accurate than above. And then minimal contact is tympanic thermometers, although very accurate use of this is not recommended in the workplace screening as there's still contact involved. Then you have your contact thermometers, which may be used in the secondary screening process or in the health sector, or if in your workplace you have medical personnel or an on-site clinic. So this is the NCIT that you all know. Important to note is that you need to read the manufacturer's instructions carefully to ensure proper use. Avoid testing in this direct sunlight. Use in a draft-free area. And it must be given time to adjust to the outside environment before use, which is about 10 to 30 minutes. Measure the temperature perpendicular to the person uh, that you're testing, either their forehead or temple. The neck and wrist can also be used as an alternative. Make sure that the area is clean and dry, not excessively covered and not blocked. The distance between the NCIT and the individual will vary according to the thermometer you're using, but typically it's held three to 15 centimeters away from the patient. And note that this device measures the body surface temperature, so it's easy to get false re readings or results depending on the outside environment. So with temperature, we need to know the ranges. So normal temperature ranges is 36.1 to 37.2 degrees Celsius. A fever is recorded as anything over and above 38 degrees Celsius, according to the WHO and CDC, and South African guidelines, actually. And uh, the temperature range you need to know about is, con uh, is determined by your work set guidelines. So in mining, health, and call center sectors, they have stricter guidelines where a fever is over and above 37.5 degrees Celsius. When it comes to calibrating your thermometer, over time you may get off readings, so your thermometer would have to be calibrated. There are various calibration laboratories around SA, which have to be SANAS approved, and those are the ones that you have to look for, and that's the South African National Accreditation System. When it comes to cleaning your thermometer, it consists of using a soft cloth dampened with water or medical alcohol, never soap or other chemicals. Wipe the lens first and then the body of the thermometer and allow it to dry completely before storing or next use. So this is just a little exercise for you guys to look at the pictures below and see what you can uh, find wrong. I'm just going to go through uh, one by one. So on this one, there's no PPE on the individual being tested and the person screening could wear a face shield. In the second picture, we see that the distance to the patient is inappropriate. There's no PPE on anyone and you can see here no physical distancing between the two people waiting to be screened. And in the last picture, Again, no PPE on the person screening, and they're screening in direct sunlight, which could alter the reading of your NCIT. So we're just gonna go through a flow chart then of screening in the workplace, step by step. So all employees, as mentioned, must undergo training with regards to COVID-19, and employees and visitors should be made aware of the screening processes. A screening area must be set up with adequate PPE at the entrances and exits, along with the non-touch sanitizing station. The person performing the screening should be wearing PPE, especially if doing a temperature test. This includes gloves, masks, and a face shield, and they should be adequately trained. When it comes to your initial screening on arrival, obtain consent for the temperature check and then perform the questionnaire. If secondary screening is required, 
make sure that that worker or visitor is isolated. So this is when they have a high temperature or a positive response to the questionnaire. And this is where having an isolation room comes into play. It's important to note, so we will go through what to do if someone does screen positive, but it's important to note that if a screening questionnaire is fine, but the person has a high temperature, that you should retest the individual's temperature after some time to ensure it was correctly captured the first time. So you need to take into consideration things like making sure that the NCIT was not faulty, uh, the outside environment must be taken into consideration, so make sure you retest the person in a different area of the body and make sure that the reading is taken in the best condition available. Just moving back onto our first line, uh, adequate waste disposal must be made available, so that's bins for throwing away of gloves and alcohol wipes, etc. If the previous person screened was positive, the person screening must remove and change all PPE and fully sanitize themselves and the screening area. And all information captured of people entering the workplace must be kept confidential. And you can keep this information for at least up to a month to alert them if there are any exposure risks. You must also rescreen the individual on exiting um, or a determined time during the day to note possible changes in symptoms of the individual. So what to do if someone screens positive? If a worker screens uh, with COVID-19 related symptoms, uh, advises the employer of these symptoms, the employer must not permit the worker to enter the workplace or report for work, or if the worker is already at work, immediately isolate the worker, provide the worker with a surgical mask, and arrange for the worker to be transported in a manner that does not place other workers or members of the public at risk, either to be self-isolated or be to referred for a medical examination or testing. You need to also assess the risk of transmission in the workplace, disinfect the area and the worker's workstation, undertake contact tracing, and refer those workers who may be at risk for screening, and take any other appropriate measure to prevent possible transmission. So this all comes from the Government Gazette. So just a few take home points. Screening must be used as an early warning mechanism to point out potential COVID-19 cases, ill employees or visitors. Remember that the screening process is not diagnostic. Therefore, if a person has any symptoms, they should be encouraged to undergo diagnostic testing to get formal results. It does not replace control measures that should be taken inside the workplace. So please, you need to still promote social distancing, washing of hands, sanitizing, and wearing of face masks. Unwell employees or visitors must stay at home. This is where symptom monitoring comes into play. Every work environment is different, therefore the screening process must be tailored to suit the environment. Employees must be trained on the various screening processes and visitors must be made aware. Encourage honesty when filling out the screening forms. Employees must know about what happens if they screen positive or have symptoms. And reduce stigma surrounding COVID-19 in the workplace. So just on that, it's a very common question that we get, so I thought I'd include a slide. Stigma is the discrimination of a specific group of people. It's associated with the lack of knowledge surrounding the disease. And of course, now during the pandemic, there's increased fear and anxiety in the population, which makes this worse. So the population groups at risk of stigma are those who have tested positive, who have recovered from COVID-19, or who were released from COVID-19 quarantine, and people who have underlying health conditions that cause a cough or any other similar symptoms to COVID-19. So you can see why people don't want to be associated with the disease. So what can be done to reduce stigma in the workplace is maintain the privacy and confidentiality of those who have symptoms, those who are seeking health care, and those who may be part of any contact investigation. Quickly communicate the risk or lack of risk from contact with products, people, and places in the workplace. Correct negative language that can cause stigma by sharing accurate information about how the virus spreads. Speak out against negative behaviors and statements and encourage transparency and two-way communication in the workplace. And all of this can be found in more in guidelines that are on the CDC website, which I've included in the references.
Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. That was uh, the presentation done by Dr. Sayuri Pillay from the Wits School of Public Health and the NIH on medical screening for COVID-19. Um, a reminder to all, please um, do not use the raise the hand function. Um, we are too large in number and that won't work. Please use the chat function to make any points you may want to make or ask any general questions. And only in the Q&A do you ask content specific and um, questions. So our next um, presenter is Sister Ida Jordan, the uh, colleague of uh, NIH colleague uh, based at the NICD. And I am going to um, uh, I'm going to uh, ask Lynn just to uh, act, share the um, the screen with regard to the contact tracing reporting and a notification. Okay, so while Ganen is preparing that, um, uh, a quick reminder, when it comes to attendance certificates, you can email hwstraining at vitshealth.co.za. Let me say that again, hwstraining at vitshealth.co.za. I will share the details again towards the end, as well as for CPD related, that is continuous professional development related matters, you can email us at info at nioh.ac.za, info at nioh.ac.za. Okay, so Glenn, over to you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. So my name is Ida. I'm the occupational health nurse um, employed by NIOH and servicing NICD. So as if our day-to-day -day job with a weekly, monthly reports is not enough, we also now need to deal with Department of Employment and Labor and Department of Health requests. So the aim for my presentation is maybe just to summarize um, these expectations and um, give a bit of guidance in the reference of the available tools that we can use um, in these reporting. So there's two main directives from the Department of um, Employment and Labor. So the one, um, is on occupational health and safety regarded to um, COVID-19. And the second one is a director for workplace acquired COVID-19, which deals with reporting. Notification or notifying is governed by the National Health Act. Um, and this is where certain medical conditions need to no be notified. Um, and COVID is one of these conditions. And then NICD provides the platform where you can report um, the, the condition. And then contact tracing is um, mainly the responsibility for from the, your regional CDC and Department of Health. But there's certainly an expectation and, uh, on the employers to assist with the contact tracing at their workplaces. So um, with the directive, there's two, the two main directives. There's the one that deals with occupational health and safety in the workplace. And there's that one famous sentence where um, it states that all positive cases in your workplace must be reported to the Department of Health and Department of Employment and Labor. So next to the word Department of Health, there's a, actually a footnote with a, a hotline or, or a, a number that you can contact, which is the NHLS hotline. So we'll deal with that later um, during the contact tracing. But next to the word Department of, of Labor, it's very silent on how exactly what and when and how should we report this. So the NIOH has engaged with the Department of Labor on this aspect. And the intention from the inspectors definitely indicates that the intention was only for work-related um, COVID cases and not every single case. So we'll just deal with those. So from the Department of uh, the, the COVID um, Occupational Health and Safety Directive, often refers to the Occupational Health and Safety Act, um, regarding risk assessment and control measures. But um, in light of reporting, it definitely refers to Section 24 and Section 25, where they expect um, employers to report um, occupational diseases to the Chief Inspector from the Department of Labor. The Director for Workplace Acquired COVID-19 refers to the OSH Act, um, Section 65, 
which um, deals with the, the compensation for occupational diseases. And that is a lot more directive and um, clear. So the, the, the way that you report, uh, before COVID, there was even the perception that if you report a Section 24 incident to the Compensation Commissioner, there was a general um, um, perception that it automatically gets reported to the Department of Labor Inspector, but this is not the case. It's definitely two um, separate reports that needs to be done. So anybody that ever tried to report a Section 24 to the Department of Labor Inspector will know it's not as easy as going to their website, click on contacts and, and get the contact number for your inspector. You need to phone the, the, your Department of Labor's office and then get the number. So depending on the person um, that answered the phone's understanding of Section 24, it can be a very easy or extremely difficult task to get these numbers. So the um, NIHLS hotline kindly uh, provided me with this list of um, contact details for inspectors and OHS specialists. So it's obviously as uh, relevant and current as the people that's still working for it, for the Department of Labor, but for today you can thank me. So reporting COVID um, to the compensation is a lot more easier and, and more direct and, and, and guidance from the directive. So you can still submit your claims um, online through CompEasy or through, through your mutual association claim system. They even give you the ICD-10 code to use. Um, you can do manual claims. We use um, complete the forms manually and send it by email. And in the directive, there's a table with all the with all your relevant um, workplace, ugh, your area's um, email address. So the forms, that the directive is also clear on all the forms that you need to complete. So it's basically the same forms that you would use for any other occupational disease from your WCL1, your employee's report, the notification, first medical, um, et cetera. There's just one additional form that you need to complete for COVID, um, which is attached to this directive, um, and it's an exposure and medical questionnaire um, that you need to send as well. Okay, so the, the directive is also um, give us clear definitions on when, when would it be considered a workplace acquired COVID-19. So it's when there's a suspected or confirmed case of COVID-19 in the workplace or while you're traveling on an official trip for work to countries where there's work um, high risk and also while performing any duty for your employer that puts you at risk for COVID. So the, the diagnosis for COVID-19 workplace acquired is dependent on um, certain conditions. So it, obviously, if, if you have got an inherent risk at work, example, um, nurses that works in hospital and directly care for people um, that's COVID-19 positive, and there's also exposure at work. So let's say a colleague maybe tested positive and you're sitting in an office with um, less ventilation, no spacing, um, that could also be a work exposure. And then, um, so I know traveling currently is not um, common, but maybe in future when COVID is still around, we still might travel for business. And then um, it also needs to have a reliable diagnosis. And the only diagnosis currently is a PCR test from laboratories. And then there also needs to be a chronological sequence between the symptoms and exposure to be considered a work acquired COVID-19. So I know um, most workplaces will have an incident accident um, register. So I think it's better if you can separate your COVID-19 register and then add um, things like the last contact that you had with a positive case, whether it's from a work colleague or um, friends and family. Um, it's almost like a project plan where you can flag all these important dates to give you the, the um, chronolo chronological sequence from lost contact to um, start of onset of symptoms um, that, that you tested. It will just help you with your identification of a work-related case. So regarding notification of uh, notifiable medical conditions, so there's a, a system NMC, um, which is run by the NICD, which requires you to um, 
report all these cases. And I think we all are exposed to this reporting system um, suddenly with COVID. Um, and it's clear why it's necessary. It's just to identify um, trends and areas where we need to direct our resources and policies to, to stop the spread of this virus. There was also a general perception that once a lab, um, whether it's private or provincial labs, tested the posit or results come positive, it automatically um, reports to the NMC. So this is true, so the data gets dumped onto this NMC system, but it doesn't report on things like symptoms, um, comorbidities, the level of treatment. Is, um, so therefore it's very important for every doctor or nurse in both the public and private sector who diagnoses a patient um, to also report COVID-19 to the, to the NICD. <clears throat> so you can also, um, if you go to the NICD website, it gives you clear directions on how to report. This can also be done manually or electronically. So there's a paper-based notification form so that you can um, complete. So if you go into the website, there will be specific forms for COVID and a specific SOP for COVID um, conditions, which is separate from the normal um, communicable diseases. So you can send these um, forms, you can email it, SMS it, WhatsApp, and yes, I've confirmed the good old fax is still well and alive. You can fax it, and then um, when you do it manually, you also need to send a copy to the sub-district or district levels. Um, for notification. So if you click on the NICD website, also there's an the option to download the app, which you can um, use to, to report these cases. So once you register as a, as a healthcare provider and you put in all your details, you can in future, we'll just log in with a um, password and you just click on the new case tab and then you can um, register these cases on the NMC. The, the good part about this is then it automatically goes to the district level and national level. So there's no double reporting on that. So this is just the website, the, the um, front page of the uh, NICD um, website. We can go to notifi by notifiable um, the NMC. <laughs> and then there's the normal forms that you need to complete, but then there's also the ones for specific for COVID-19. And if you go into the app, um, the front page of the app, there's also an icon for COVID-19, which is actually to a different um, reporting section than the other normal communicable diseases. <clears throat> so just for contact tracing, so um, it, like I mentioned before, it, it is um, in the best interest of the employer and for the country to, to assist with contact tracing at the workplace. And um, so when somebody tests positive, you need to, to get a list from people where, you know, all the places that they visited in the work environment um, from two days before their symptoms starts. And the two days before the symptom, because we'll know that you're most infectious um, two days before the start of onset of symptoms. So you would want to trace those people that were close contacts to the person that tested positive. So that would include all the workers that work close with him, but also visitors to the workplace, contractors, maybe people that have a travel um, arrangements together. So you'll need to um, get all the names. So also on the NICD website, there's this um, flow chart that I think is a good um, thing to use at your workplace. Um, so it just gives you this, the, the sequence of events. Um, so once you've got the list of close contacts, um, with from your uh, positive case, you can do a, a risk analysis of the work area. Maybe that they eat together, sitting closely. Was there enough ventilation in there? Maybe an open plan office, and then you define whether that contact was a, a close contact, a casual contact, or no contact at all. And um, Dr. Nick van der Water will go more into detail of how to define close or casual contacts. Um, but yeah, so if you if you identify high risk close contact, then you need to quarantine. Um, if you're casual contact or, or, or low risk um, contact, you can continue working. But all of you need all of them need to um, monitor their symptoms. As soon as they develop symptoms, um, they can also go for a test. And if they test positive, the whole um, 
inspection start over you do contact tracing from the second positive case again. And also from the, um, the, the director from the Department of Labor where the, it indicated that you need to contact every case must be reported to the Department of Health. It is basically to, to assist with contact tracing and there is an automatic system from the labs that um, informs the Department of Health if there's a positive case. But like any other system, there's, there's some for, form of manual capturing. So sometimes the um, cell phone number could be captured incorrectly for various reasons. So therefore, it's really important for the worker or the employer to also report the positive cases to the Department of Health. And um, our call center also kindly provided me with all the contact details for the Department of Health section. And that is me. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, Sister Ida Jordan, um, who's a colleague at the NIH based at the NICD, that's the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. Thank you very much. And she's brought her own personal touch to her presentation and quite a lot of important information, experience and um, contact details there and resources and tools for you to look at. Okay, so our next presenter is Dr. Nick van der Water. Um, he is dealt with the quarantine and isolation topic. Uh, that's business continuity plans in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. And a reminder that you can use the Q&A, that's the question answer section to ask uh, content specific questions. Um, we do have our NIH uh, panelist team that's uh, online at the moment answering the questions uh, it goes into the open section and you will see the answers for your particular question there. Uh, general comments, which I respond to some of them, will be in the chat group. Um, my sound was lost for a moment, but it has been restored. And I will now ask my colleague Glenn just to um, make the next uh, connection for us. Thank you. Thanks, Ashraf, and thank you, NIOH, for hosting the session. Um, I hope we all can learn something today and um, yeah, I think the disclaimer is that COVID-19 is still only eight months old uh, or seven, yeah, call it eight months and uh, we're still all learning a lot about, about COVID-19 so um, I hope we can learn together. So I'll be speaking about quarantine and isolation this morning um, and essentially we get a lot of questions and as a occupational medicine specialists, I get a lot of queries from, from nurses or from various uh, workplaces. I get um, some of the questions that you have on the screen and, and, and you might pick up errors in the statements, but I, I just sort of try to quote um, as I have heard in the recent past. And, and there's a lot of confusion um, and there's a lot of noise around what is quarantine, what is isolation and what do I do it and how do I do it? And, and I, I hope that I can provide a, a um, an approach that would make it relatively easy and that should cover most instances and where, where it doesn't then uh, I think probably seeking professional help in, in the occupational medical, medical practitioner or a specialist is a, is a great idea as well. So um, I, there's a team of people that wrote an article that was published in the Daily Maverick uh, or I found it online um, and in the essence I found these two definitions of isolation and quarantine um, in that article. So isolation means that you are that after you develop symptoms of COVID-19 and or test positive for SARS-CoV-2 COV2 virus, you need to stay apart from others as not to spread the virus to them. This includes asymptomatic people who have a positive test. In other words, isolation is for people who are sick with COVID-19, whether you have symptoms or not. Um, and quarantine is, means that after you have had a high-risk exposure to COVID-19 contact, you need to stop being in contact with other people and stay apart. This is in case you have contracted COVID-19 from your initial exposure. So in summary, quarantine is for those people that have had an exposure, but that may not yet be sick. Um, so I've put up a little picture here and you'll see um, my blue people and my yellow people throughout the presentation. Um, and um, 
you'll see that the blue in essence in my presentation represents um, an index case or a person that was symptomatic and was tested positive. In other words, somebody that goes into isolation. And the yellow represents those that were high risk contactors. And I'm, I'm, you'll see throughout my presentation, I'll be using the workplace predominantly as my framework. Um, but I think you can apply this to other situations as well. Um, and so these yellow people were exposed to this blue person. Um, and they were um, high-risk contacts, which we will talk about a little bit just now, and they were placed under quarantine. Right, so how long should you isolate for? And in essence, the National Department of Health recently updated their guidelines on the isolation period. This image that I got was from Twitter, um, and it essentially says that an asymptomatic or a person with mild disease should isolate from 10 days after symptom onset where there is symptoms, or 10 days after the initial positive test, um, should they be asymptomatic. Now, in essence, in the general public, we probably shouldn't be testing very many asymptomatic people. And I'll explain that a little bit more just now. When there's a severe disease, and, a, and in essence, the difference between mild and severe disease is somebody that goes to hospital. So mild disease, just as a reminder, you would be able to isolate at home. And that's where the thing of self-isolation comes in. If you're going to a hospital, you're not isolating yourself. Uh, you're being isolated in a hospital. So self-isolation would be essentially isolation in your own facility. Similar with quarantine, and we'll discuss that just now, you can self-quarantine, and that means at home, but not, it doesn't always necessarily mean that you'll be self-quarantined. There are facilities around the country where some employers are providing quarantine spaces um, for employees, and that would not necessarily be a self-quarantine. And so the difference between self-quarantine and or quarantine is, 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 is really just about where you do it. Um, but we'll get to quarantines. And the question is really, why, why is this talk about isolation being 10 days and quarantine 14 days, and, and why not both the same? So let's move on and try and understand. Just before we do that, um, there was a media statement about the reduction of the isolation period. Um, and a lot of people got sort of stuck on whether we could, as businesses, go forward and use the tender isolation period. Um, and uh, there is uh, this letter that we've signed out by the Director General of Health, um, which essentially confirms that we we can very well go and use the 10 day isolation period in our workplaces. So why quarantine of 14 days? Well, I, I borrowed this slide from a uh, talk about um, the production of vaccines, but I think this is a very good slide to explain the immune response to viral infections. And I think the, the collaborative group that wrote the article that was published in the Daily Maverick expressed this as well very well. You'll see in this picture that in the very beginning, you get exposed, and this is, um, I hope you can see my mouse, but if you look in the bottom left of this graph, you'll see the light blue is, is the, the onset of the virus, or, or when you first, first get exposed to the virus. Um, and that's day zero. You'll see that the virus is only detectable, and it's very light on my screen, and I hope you can see it, but essentially this is around, day five, day six, and that's why we, we, there is some talk about testing healthcare workers on day five, but the virus starts being detectable around about then, and your symptom onset is only a little, a little bit later. Now you'll see this virus detectable curve goes up quite sharply and then comes down again as all these other graphs start kicking in, and that's our natural immune response towards coronavirus, um, and gets to around about day 10 or so um, after um, 10 to well, after initial exposure, remember this is not after symptom onset, but 10 to 12 after initial exposure, that your virus detectable levels go quite low. So why quarantine for 14 days? In essence, um, I'm gonna explain that on the next slide, but in, in essence, it covers the initial period that it takes your body to start having the virus replicating your system and en enough period of the disease uh, for you to be safe, to be returning to the workplace. So the question is, do we need to test on return? Because what happens, aren't we putting somebody that's potentially COVID positive in the workplace? And essentially, I've put this picture up because if you ask a computer, 
are all of the flowers on the screen daisies? The computer will tell you, yes, they are all daisies. But the reality is that some of the daisies are dead or have passed their, their life, and some of the daisies are alive. And the, similar, and the same, exact same thing happens with our PCR testing that we use to detect the COVID virus that is causing the pandemic. The, the test itself is not able to differentiate between a complete whole blood COVID-19 virus, um, or uh, sorry, SARS-CoV-2, and it, it's bit between a whole SARS-CoV-2 and a fragments of part of a virus. And in essence, there are studies that I have now shown um, and this is not something we can do routinely because the level of safety and especially in the occupational field of protecting the workers, um, there are studies that have shown and have cultured the virus and that show that after day eight or day nine, most people do not have viable virus. In other words, you can't grow that virus from that person after day eight or nine. So isolation returning on day 10 is safe because we know that by day eight or day nine, the person is known of, from symptom onset or from testing an asymptomatic person that they are no longer shedding the virus or no longer able to infect other persons. Similarly, with quarantine, we give four extra days for that initial onset of the immune response in the body and for the virus to replicate and for that person to go through the processes and then return to work safely after 14 days with very low chance of being able to infect other people. So let's go back to our blue person and our yellow people. Uh, our blue person is uh, what we would call our index case or our primary case in the workplace. Then he got symptoms or he or she got symptoms um, and that would be considered day one of the isolation. But unfortunately, there was a bit of a slip um, and this is something we hear very commonly. The symptoms were very mild. Um, and sort of they slip through the screening process. And I often say to workplaces, this is not a failure, this is just human nature. But on day two, they're going to work and they were sent home at lunchtime because the employer or the manager decided, found them at work and said, oh, are you quite sick? Um, I think you should rather go home. So they were sent home. They did contact tracing and they found that these three yellow workers were high risk contacts, and we'll speak about high risk contacts, high risk in a moment. Um, and we will know then that their quarantine day one is their last date of exposure. So 10 days after the symptom onset in our blue person's case, he may return to work the next day. And 10 days after quarantine, in our yellow people, they may return to work. Notice I haven't said anything about symptoms. And, and really, if, if one of the people, the yellow people, become symptomatic at any point of time, they would follow the normal route and approach their treating professional or phone the COVID hotline and decide or find out whether they need to go and get tested further. So high risk and low risk. How do we know the difference? Um, some people call it a close contact or a casual contact, and that was mentioned in the previous presentation. And we know that SARS-CoV-2 is spread primarily through respiratory particles. These particles can breathe in and, and land on our eyes, nose, or mouth. And there's also talk now of airborne spread of COVID-19. The reality is the science is, is emerging and we, we're learning more and more about the spread of COVID-19, but we, we're pretty sure about most of the spread at this point in time. Now the regulations refer to the National Department of Health Guidelines where the high-risk exposure is defined as close contact within one meter of COVID-19 conf COVID confirmed case for 15 minutes without PPE or with failure of PPE and or direct contact with respiratory secretions of a COVID-19 case. Now this bottom last section probably only applies to medical personnel who are, are working directly excuse me, whoops, uh, with COVID-19 um, patients. Now, our Prof Karim, who we all know by now, has, has, has really reiterated that this 15 minutes mentioned here is really an, it's an arbitrary measure. It's a, it's a, it's a 
scientific estimate rather than an exact amount. And we need to apply some, some thought to um, defining high risk versus low risk exposure. So how do we go about doing that? So we may ask some questions to ascertain our exposure, but before we ask those questions, I need to just explain how do we look at risk. So a risk is essentially a hazard and exposure. Yeah, Mr. Yellow or Mrs. Yellow is holding a stick of dynamite. That's hazardous. If you add an exposure of a candle to that, you can get an explosion and that would be a risk. So, a lot of our risk in COVID-19 depends on exposure. So the questions that we're gonna ask are relating to exposure. So how long were you in contact with that person? 15 minutes is a good guideline. Now they talk about with PPE or PPE failure, um, how far apart did you stay? Was it one meter? Was it two meters? Was it five meters? Were you outside? Were you inside? That's not a question that I put in here. But I think that it, in, in, in essence, when you're outside and two meters apart, you have a lot of dilution of any COVID-19 that is coming from an infected person. And therefore, your risk is lower because you have a lower exposure to the virus because of the amount of virus that you've been exposed to. Were people in the area following hand sanitizing or mask wearing rules? Did you share meals together? Did you share stationery or office equipment? Did you work in an office together? How big was that office? What was the ventilation in that office? Do you socialize outside of the work with that person? We've had a lot of cases where people drive together at work and they've chosen to do so because they feel that public transport is, is a risk and they carpool but now have exposed themselves in a car and haven't necessarily worn masks while driving in a car in the middle of winter where we don't expect people to drive with open windows. So there's a lot of questions that we can ask around this. And just going back to this, we have this guideline of less than 15 minutes uh, and uh, greater than one meter apart to to help us define whether that risk is a high risk or low risk. And in essence, this is not a hard science in my opinion, and, and we need to apply our minds to doing the contract tracing. What is really important is to do the contract tracing and is to make an evaluation and to, to I would say, err on the side of caution. And I will, I will explain why err on the side of caution a little bit later in the presentation. So let's keep it simple. Isolation is for 10 days after the start of suggestive symptoms and for 10 days after a test in asymptomatic positive cases. And as I've mentioned, that should be relatively rare in the non-healthcare worker setup. Quarantine for 14 days if you're exposed to a high risk situation. And just out of management for a low risk, I haven't really mentioned that um, actively, but in essence, the low risk workers, we would say that they have an equivalent to community level exposure and they can therefore continue work provided that they do not become symptomatic. We then need to ensure our contact tracing when there is a case in the workplace and we need to make a differentiation as to whether a person is a high risk and they go to quarantine and a low or a low risk and they are going to continue to work whilst monitoring their symptoms on a twice daily basis. So what about normal flu? And this is a question I get quite a lot. And it is flu season. Um, fortunately, it's warming up a little bit across the country in the last while. But in essence, COVID and flu can often look very much the same. COVID, we know, present, our previous presenters have shown those those six sort of typical presentations. But in essence, we've seen that COVID presents from everything from weakness to dizziness to you name it. It's got very strange presentations. Um, and I have, I have heard a, a good few of them in my practice. The reality is COVID and flu can often look very, very similar. And 
people sometimes go to a doctor and the doctor will say, no, it's just normal flu. And you get a sick note that says literally in inverted commas, normal flu. They then sometimes even go for a test and that test may be negative, but may not really be negative. And we know that there's an element of false negative testing um, up to about a third of tests could be false negative. And in essence, the PCR test for COVID-19 is more designed to look for positive cases rather than negative cases. So I don't generally, as, a, as a somebody that advises companies, I personally don't put a lot of weight in a negative test. And a company's approach really depends on the company's risk at appetite and operational requirements in terms of whether they allow a person with COVID-19 symptoms on a negative test that is labeled as normal flu to return to work sooner or not. In some companies, we've found that the companies have said, should that person have symptoms that are compatible with COVID-19, irrespective of the outcome of the test, we still want them to isolate for 10 days. I've taken a middle ground and quite a lot of companies and managers and companies find that a quite um, palatable approach and, and I've advised that you also don't want a lot of flu in your workplace. So should it be normal flu, you also don't want to be spreading flu in your workplace because that then makes the next worker get the same flu and they would then go off and get tested for COVID-19 and that causes them to have, so potentially you could drive up your absenteeism rate by allowing what the so-called normal flu in your workplace. And my advice to, to managers is to say that it's a bit of a balance and try to ensure that we keep absenteeism at um, an, an average level. We're never going to have low absenteeism, unfortunately, during COVID-19, just by the nature of the virus and what it is. But I think it's really important to try and find a middle balance um, between everybody being away from the workplace. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, business continuity in the moment. So I'm not a, a, a business person. I do not hold an MBA. And really, I'm talking about business con continuity plans from an occupational health perspective. And, and I'll explain, about the, explain why I, I say that in a moment. But before I do that, I just want to define what a business continuity plan is. And it's, it, the planning is, a pro, is the process of creating systems of prevention and recovery to deal with potential threats to a company. In addition to prevention, the goal is to enable ongoing operations before and during execution of disaster recovery. So business continuity aims to keep the systems running. And there's a whole bunch of threats that we have to our businesses during COVID-19. And some of these um, on this slide come from the World Economic Forum, and some I've just kind of thought about and out of my own experience. But a, You'll see on this slide, I'm not going to go through each of them because I'll show you the slide again in a moment, but there are a lot of threats to business at the moment. And these I, I thought would be direct threats at this point of time, but the reality is that they are ongoing and long-term threats as well. There's an interesting psychological principle on dealing with anxiety around issues, and that's to operate within your spheres of control and influence. And really, we can control with what we can control. We can only influence what we can influence and the rest we can't really do that much about. And the idea is to try and focus on your circles of control and influence. So what can we control and influence? Can we control absenteeism? Realistically, we can control parts of absenteeism and I'll explain that. And I think that's a really important thing to do is to look what we can control with regards to absenteeism and look into business continuity during COVID-19. The second thing, supply chain disruptions, we can probably have influence on that. And, and I think I'm not going to talk to this specifically because that's certainly not my area of expertise. Movement restrictions, changing tourism flows, probably we don't have a lot of influence unless you're in those sectors or unless you're in the higher up. But Realistically, the average business probably doesn't have much control or influence on that. Remote working and online security, cyber, cyber attacks have become a, a major issue in business in the recent time. And I would encourage any business to, to make sure that your, your electronic security is excellent. Cash flow issues, 
we have some influence on that, um, ensuring good invoicing and quotations when they need to happen, good service, following up with clients. I'm not going to talk to that specifically. What can we do about a prolonged recession? Probably not very much, uh, but we can do, make sure that our business does our part. But in the terms of the recession, not really within our spheres of control or influence. And mental health issues in the workplace, I think certainly employers have a major influence on the uh, mental health of their employees. So let's talk about these two, absenteeism and mental health issues. So absenteeism, um, this is taken from a couple of days ago. Um, this is a graph from the situation reports from the World Health Organization. And you'll see this graph has just seems to have a never ending, increasing upward slope. Um, it goes up and down, then goes down for review does, and then it seems to go up again and down for review. And, and uh, this can be really, really anxiety provoking. Um, and the question really for that I wanted to ask myself was how many workers are currently infected? So if we have a recovery rate of 61%, and this was two days ago, I think it went up a little bit to 62% yesterday. Um, but that I, my, my simple maths, and I may be wrong, but my simple maths said that we got just under 300,000 active cases, um, and uh, sorry, 177,000 active cases, um, of which probably around about 100,000 of those are workers. I'm just I'm reading my maths while I do this and wondering if I did this right. But in essence, there's a lot of workers and a lot of workplaces that are affected by workers that are currently infected with COVID-19 at this point in time. This doesn't even include all of those that are in quarantine. So how do we manage absenteeism in the workplace? So the firstly, we need to have good policies on absenteeism. Your sick leave policies need to be clear. And it, I think even further in COVID-19, you need to have a COVID-19 policy to speak to how do you deal with COVID-19 when a worker gets it. And I think this is different to every workplace. For example, a healthcare worker might be different to a shop steward in a factory. Um, so your workplace needs to have specific policies on how you manage absenteeism around COVID-19 and, and obviously absenteeism in general. There could be rewards for good attendance, obviously within reason, because you don't want to get people into the workplace um, that now hide their symptoms of COVID-19 because they are seeking the rewards for that. Um, you could provide provision of employee support um, because oftentimes absenteeism might not be related to a positive COVID-19 infection, but an employee that is um, mentally or emotionally distressed and, and is able to cope due to perhaps a family member that has passed or something to that extent. And then lastly, you can reduce the amount of COVID-19 in the workplace. And I really, one of my, one of my approaches is that keep, it, keep the simple things prominent. You can make sure you do your risk assessments. You can make sure you can maintain physical distancing, hand cleansing and sanitizing, cleaning routines, and the wearing of masks in the workplace. And so the basics are really important to reduction of COVID-19 in the workplace. And then we have spoken this morning about active screening, active, effective contact tracing and notification of cases appropriate quarantine and isolation. And then the summary here really is that if you are a workplace that has not had a case of COVID-19 in your workplace, I think that's um, very great for you. But the aim is to have not no COVID, but low COVID in our workplaces. Try and make your workplace a place where the potential to acquire COVID-19 is way lower than in the community around you. So using a not so hypothetical situation, because unfortunately this, I have adapted this, but it comes from real life. Is a worker presents to work with mild symptoms. So Mr. Blue, he, he has got COVID-19, but hasn't been tested yet. Uh, it's his birthday, so he brought a cake with a nice candle and shared it with his other two colleagues. Um, and they sat in their small tea room. Um, and a few days later, this Mr. Yellow got COVID-19, but didn't know about it yet, was exposed to his colleagues, and a little while later, they all had COVID-19. Needless to say, this workforce 
actually ended up having real difficulties for a few weeks in managing their normal work flow because of poor management of controls in the workplace and poor management of quarantine and isolation of workers. So this yellow person would have been a high risk contact and should have immediately, when they found out, been put into quarantine. And I've seen this on countless occasions. And it really goes to speak to effective contact tracing and effective um, uh, and, and appropriate quarantine and isolation really does drive down absenteeism. As I said, it's, there is really not an environment where we can have no COVID in our workplaces, but we need our trial level best to have as little or low COVID in our workplaces. So what are some other examples of plans or, or, or um, methods that companies have used to uh, um, try and reduce the amount of COVID-19 in the workplace? Things like changes in shift rotations. I've noticed, noted some, some employers have gone from a two shift rotation to a three shift rotation. So that should they have COVID-19 on one of the three shifts, they then isolate the entire shift and go back to two shifts, so, uh, or sorry, sorry quarantine, isolate the person with COVID and quarantine the rest of the shift, and then go back to a two shift system while those people are in quarantine and isolation respectively. And when they get back, they go back to a three shift system. So that allows them a little bit of flexibility and it allows them to con have a better work continuity during the difficult time. Some workplaces have reduced the number of or numbers or in work areas, so the numbers of workers, and I think that has been said in some quite well. But what I've noticed in some um, more industrial sites is that people have reduced people in areas like control rooms, where back in the day, um, it would have been a place where there was the main task had been done, there would be a lot of socialization in the control room. Now what they say is they will only have two people in those control rooms at any one time, and then if you're finished with your task on the main floor of the plant, you then go and rest in an alternate place. Remote instrument access is similarly on the same industrial setup. They've set up computer access, which operates big machinery from a remote venue um, within the site, but so still on site, but allowing the um, operator to work at uh, in a in a it's a secluded area where he doesn't have access to other workers. Virtual meetings, even in the very same workplace. Um, so I, I have companies where they have five boardrooms and if they've got five people that are coming for a meeting, each one sits in their own boardroom, uses the company's data, and they have virtual meetings within the company. And then staggered work times. Um, this is one that I feel quite strongly about is allowing different departments to arrive at different times. So if you've got department one, two, and three, you'll start department one at 10 to seven, you'll start department two at seven o'clock, and you'll start department three at 10 past seven, allowing as little as possible interaction between those departments that should one department have a person that develops COVID-19 and you need to quarantine, the other people in the workplace, you are really only likely to have high risk exposures in department, one of the, those departments, which allows continuity in the other departments at that work site. Right, so looking at mental health, and I'd really just have to say right up hand, I'm not a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I asked my wife, who is a clinical psychologist, to prepare these slides for me, and we've talked through these, and hopefully I can do it justice. On the left hand side is really this, this slide is des describing the human experience during COVID-19 and, and uh, my, my wife often talks about in the clinical psychology realm is normalizing and validating people's experience. So to allow people to experience emotions and to experience feelings is, is normal. And on the left is something we might know quite well. It is uh, often called the crisis cycle. Uh, I know it as the grief cycle, um, but there's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And the reality is that this is not a linear progression through this. And it may get messy. You may get a little bit of denial and a bit of anger. You may get denial, then depression, and then anger. And so this, this is, is all one mushy mess 
until you get sort of to a point of acceptance. And I think we're all dealing with this crisis of COVID-19 at this point in time. On the left, oh, sorry, on the right hand side is what we know as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And in essence, we only realize self-actualization and that's where we want our employees, the people that we look after, the people in our workplaces, we want to have, to have them realize self-actualization. That's the best form of worker. The worker that is uh, looking after your policies, the worker that is being punctual, the worker that is doing the tasks that are provided to them, this is your ideal worker. But as you can see through Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we are struggling with some of the very basic bottom line items, physical. We are struggling with physical needs at this point of time. Bread and milk and just getting to the shop is very scary. And we, some people have financial difficulties at this point of time. And you know, some people are providing for three or four or five families and are really struggling uh, to provide for their very basic physical needs. Without completion, without a realization of physical needs, it's very difficult to progress to the next one, which is security. COVID-19 goes without saying. Our security is very much affected during this. Social, social isolation by definition prevents us from reaching this. Ego and so on. This, this triangle is very difficult to achieve during COVID-19. So how do you as a, as a manager, how do workplaces, how do employers help their employees uh, or support their staff during COVID-19? And before we go to this, I, I, I changed this little picture on the right in the blue um, octagon to look like a stop sign because stop before you say anything in the workplace. Should you say it? And is it the right time to say it? So always be reminded, should I say this? And is it the right time to say it? So there's seven points over the next two slides. Um, and the first is to make compassionate contact with your employee or with people in your workplace. Show interest, make time to talk about their problems, but remain respectful. Sometimes it's not the right time to say it, but when the time is right and when you should say it, show interest, allow, be open and allow people to be talking to you um, and show interest in their lives. Enhance their sense of safety. Um, Often times, so we've spoken a lot about quarantine and isolation. One of the ways of enhancing safety in the workplace is to have people actively waiting as opposed to passively waiting. So we want a worker to feel like he has a purpose in a workplace. So instead of us saying to a worker who is now the only low risk worker because he happened to be off on the day that the person brought cake to work um, with COVID-19, um, and he came back and he was now not exposed and he's the only person left in the department. Give that person something to do actively. Don't let that person sit around and do nothing and not have a sense of purpose. Make sure the employees are aware of the next steps. How are we going to go about going to the next? This speaks a lot to the policies that you have in the workplace, but not only to have policies, but to ensure that your workers are aware of what the policies say. So that's education and training about them. Identify a person's current need. It's really important not to assume that you know what the person needs. Ask open questions. So somebody may um, have a, a spouse that passed away. You you may um, you may think that they need food to because now they aren't able to produce food. But perhaps if you ask the right questions, their biggest need is extra data because of the amount of WhatsApp calling that they've had to do to deal with all the issues around it. Get practical. Problem solving may be impured, impaired during a crisis. And this is really, really common. When we go through crisis situations, our, our, our ability to manage and to do problem solving well decreases. Um, and ask questions like, would it be helpful if, um, and help connect them with resources to in increase their hope. This may be community resources. Um, so is there is, uh, perhaps a, um, somebody in the community that's delivering food or something to that effect? Would it be helpful if I connect you with the person that delivers vegetables on a routine basis? And then the last three, connect them with social support. Um, that may be the family, the team, the colleagues. Very importantly, 
if you have a colleague that's off with COVID-19, there's been a lot of talk about stigma and really encourage your employees, but not force your employees, encourage those when they do it on their own volition, that they do it on their own volition, to support each other through the COVID-19. So if you know that your, your colleague has been off, pop them a WhatsApp and say, hey, I hope you're doing okay. Really sorry to hear, hear you a bit under the weather. Provide information on coping. Um, and so there are different ways to cope. There's good ways, that's the adaptive ways of coping. And then there's the maladaptive way of coping. So good ways of coping include self-care, routine, hobbies, social support, relaxation, breathing. And we can all learn to breathe. That's a count, breathe in for a count of four breaths and breathe out slowly. Maladaptives may be overworking, risky behavior, substance abuse, and the lastly, link that person with services, should it be normal? And the question here is, what is normal anyway during COVID-19? However, I think the most important to remember, and this is the psychological principle, is that in people that uh, a, a disorder is generally defined as something where you're not able to perform Perform your normal tasks. So should your employee not be able to perform more normal tasks, offer to help them to connect them with things like the EAP. And then just lastly, um, there's a whole bunch of mental health services available and the slides will be distributed so you can see um, this as well. Um, and there's a couple of links in the slide that you can follow. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you. That was uh, Dr. Nick van der Water, who dealt with the quarantine and isolation aspects, business continuity plans in the light of COVID-19 pandemic. Very, very useful advice and uh, information provided, critical for you to implement in your workplaces to ensure that uh, we have a safer and healthier workplace in this period of the COVID-19 epidemic within the national setting and pandemic in a global setting. So uh, a reminder, if you've got any questions, please uh, type those questions in the question and answer box and our group of panelists will address those uh, questions for you. Any other general comments you could raise in the chat box and I will give you specific email and other contact details to um, address when uh, we, before we close. So our next uh, presenter is Dr. Jan Napier. Um, and this is uh, an interesting um, presenter in that he is both an occupational medical practitioner and a qualified legal um, um, a lawyer. And so, uh, Dr. Lapier is dealing with the remuneration, remuneration for COVID-19 related employee absence at work. And this I found also a very interesting presentation. So I, I just hand over to my colleague, Glenn, um, to initiate the uh, uh, presentation on his side. Thank you for having, having me. And um, just to tell you that what, uh, what we're gonna discuss today here, we'd like to get all HR officers, HR managers to sharpen their ears and also sharpen their pencil. Um, we, we're in a, in a new world, uh, we're in a new normal, and we need, to, we need to adapt to the new normal, but we need to use what employees and employers have saved over the years um, for an event like this. And this is really what I'd like to enlighten here. We've got a notifiable disease and a national epidemic, um, and that creates a different world, um, a new normal, and we have to adapt to that new normal particularly when you're looking at the remuneration of employees um, in, this, in these circumstances. Um, we essentially are, are going to look at two aspects. We're going to look at what, what creates absence in this notifiable disease cum national disaster. And we're also going to have a, a short look at where does the right of remuneration in South Africa actually come from? Um, some of you may have seen what happened in New York, where basically people were told from yesterday, from today to tomorrow, you've got no more job, no more income, no more nothing. We, we are not there. We've, we're far from there. We have a right that entrenched in common law. We have a whole lot of labor statutes, labor laws, 
We have our employment contract, which is a very strong document that allows employer policies to be incorporated. And then we have those latest directives um, under the Disaster Management Act. So this is my resume of what this COVID is causing in work absence. During a full lockdown, employees could not present for work because the employer was closed. Even in the current alert levels, as you've seen even from Nick, it, it, is, it is a health and safety control to reduce your staff um, to have a, a complement of people that may not yet be at, at work. Um, it, it's also economically driven. Um, if we look at Eastern Cape here from the Windy City, um, we, we're looking at probably 30% drop in car manufacturing, which really means that 30% of our current employees in that industry might not be at work yet. So these are pretty much the same for them. The, the, and the third class is the vulnerable employees. They, they're a very important group because um, if you look at the risk severity of COVID-19, it doesn't lie in that majority, that large 80% majority of people that will get minor disease. It lies in those vulnerable employees, those that get uh, the severe disease and that, that risk of dying. So our, our whole economic effort, our whole disaster effort is actually only there because we have this vulnerable group. And in this vulnerable group, there, there are people with very high comorbidity risk severity, and those people may not be able to work at this stage. The next class are obviously the people who have COVID at this stage, and that may be either workplace acquired COVID, as we discovered earlier on, there's compensation cover for those that acquire it. Um, uh, as it arises out of and in the course of employment. And then there is not workplace requirement, social, require, social acquired uh, COVID. And then the last one is what uh, Dr. Nick was talking about is those people that can't come to work because there are close high risk contacts and need to go into self quarantine. And once again there, um, in terms of rights and benefits, there's a distinction between those that have a workplace close contact and those who have a contact, a close contact outside the workplace. And in that one, uh, we can split them once again in those people that are suspect COVID cases, in other words, for which the law provides them to be the old PUI person under investigation, or the uh, suspect cases it is in our current health, uh, health program. And then also employees with high risk behavior that go out of the home bubble and, and, and move themselves into, into social risks outside the workplace. The right to be remunerated uh, in, in South Africa comes obviously from, from two big aspects. The, the one is the employment itself with the employer, and it's the right to be remunerated by the employer, which essentially is a contract of service between an employer who will pay and an employee who will offer his or her services. And then there is, of course, as we've lived through our, 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 long, our long social and economic life, there, there are a number of social networks, a number of employee benefit structures, which may also remunerate an employee. And those are at the instance of collective bargaining, unemployment rights, occupational disease rights, insured health benefits, and, and now the funds released to the state of national disaster. And I, I can remember the first talk I had with Ashraf on the same forum, I was talking about bazookas, and Ashraf didn't know what bazookas were. Those last ones are the bazookas. They are the billions of rands that our president is actually releasing to make sure that uh, our business can keep going. So if, you, if you're going to uh, complete this talk, we're going to have to make sure that every one of those little cells in these columns are filled out. You're gonna have to find out if somebody's in full lockdown, where is there a right to remuneration for that absence? If somebody's in alert levels, vulnerable employees, workplace acquired, social acquired COVID, workplace close contact, private close contact, and high risk behavior. And the last slide will fill, uh, fill you up with those. It's important to look that our, our bottom line, although we are a constitutional democracy, um, underneath or between that lives in uh, the common law principle. And in the common law principle, an employee who has got a job must present for work. 
and the employer must actually give that work that he will contract it to the employee to give. And the employer must remunerate the employee for the work done. These are the very basic principles. So you can see that at the moment that an employee doesn't present for work, then the employer doesn't have to pay. So the common law principles evidently have to be overruled by our statutes. And this is what is our South African labor law. And if you look at the statutory law principles that allow us to, to pay when we're not presenting for work, um, they are listed here. The first one is the Basic Condition of Employment Act, which gives a right to sick pay paid by the employer. It's a conditional right. Um, lots of employees, and unfortunately also my colleagues, often forget that the employee also has to be so sick that he or she cannot work and it is limited in time. There, there, are only, there are only so many days in a three year cycle that an employee will pay for that, then an employer will pay for this. Um, the uh, second labor law is the Labor Relations Act. Um, and that Labor Relations Act gives us the chance to go into collective bargaining. Now collective bargaining is where groups of employees and groups of employers make additional rights, additional duties, additional arrangements beyond the Basic Condition of Employment Act. And so what can now be created is additional sick pay, which is now might be paid by the employer or might be paid by a collective fund, which they have saved over the years. And obviously at, at the end, um, those bargaining councils also often have insurances for temporary total disability payment um, which, which can become available to employees. So, so this is where I once again go to the beginning and urge IHR practitioners, we need to go and find out what all is available. There, there are billions of rands that are lying here um, and that we could, we could really expose our employees to in these hard times. Um, the insurance industry has not played the game. I see now that they've, they've two, of, two more of them are starting to pay pay out employers for, or, or businesses for lost income. But even here with the insured benefit, I, th I think we're up for a fight and we must be ready for a fight. And that's why the facts that we're given, for instance, today by all the speakers before me are very important. There are insurance benefits there for temporary total disability due to COVID or to any of those COVID events. Um, the third one was covered by previous speakers. It's the Compensation Act, which gives the employee the right to occupational disease, temporary total disability, and if there would be further loss compensation for that. The fourth one is the, um, the, the latest collective um, consolidated directive of the 4th of June, which now clearly states that a high risk, close contact at work um, engages the basic condition of employment, sick pay right. Although that employee, as you know, high risk, close contact is self-quarantine, is not self-isolation, is not illness. Our law has changed this temporarily so that that employee is entitled to, um, to sick pay, to the sick pay benefits under the Basic Condition of Employment Act. And then the, the, last, the last statutory, uh, um, requirement, uh, statutory right that's available is the unemployment illness benefits, those are the old benefits that if an employee runs out of that number one basic condition of Employment Act sick pay, the employee can then still claim sick benefits through the unemployment insurance fund. And then additionally, the terse illness benefit, which has now also come into the director of the 25th of March. So that's kind of the bundle that we need to now go and select ourselves on from a statutory uh, principle. Just a, a few details on that one is that um, the, the sick pay is obviously only for certified illness and has got a maximum of 30 days in three years, or if you're working uh, seven days a week, it might be 42 days in three years, but it's limited. The Labor Relations Act, the bargaining council sick pay may be a reduced quantum, so it can be, it can be maybe for another 30 days at half pay and then another 30 days at the percentage of pay. And the temporary total disablement, as I mentioned, is dependent on the insured terms, but also on the way those terms are being read. The Compensation Act is clearly limited to 30 days, although there is a clause that make, make it may longer, but remember that is only 75% of the wages. 
and there's a statutory maximum um, for people with higher wages. High risk contact work, we have the same as, as in one, the, the, the six certificate. Um, it's not actually clear whether that same limitation applies, but one would assume that that same maximum duration applies. Um, the UAF sick pay is directly paid to employees and is not readily cash. Um, that is a di diplomatic way of saying that the UAF payment is not really up to date. And UAF is also a reduced quantum paid to uh, pay to the employer so these are you know they they, they sound they sounded rosy in the previous in the previous slide but they are not absolute as you can see in here um the so these are the statutory rights i said i said i said earlier we have a common law right we have a statutory right and then we have right and we have the employment contract now the employment contract can add a lot of rights to that um, obviously, every employment contract automatically includes all the previous rights. You cannot exclude those. You can just improve them. And so one way of improving them is through employer policies. There's a duty to have a covered policy. Now that needs to look at what am I doing with people in self-quarantine? What am I doing with close contacts? What am I doing with casual contacts? Um, how, how do I arrange working from home? Um, so there's, there's a lot of policy change that is required at employers. And, and um, I, I see from, from my practice that often um, employers are starting to do things, shooting from the hip, and, and then, then suddenly um, they create a precedent, and now we don't know if it's a covered policy or not. Um, so it's important for employers that these policies are put into place and that they look at the permutations that we need to clear here today. Um, then in employment contract, there may also be a sector-specific additional sick pay. Um, I, I did put it in the employment contract because you, obviously you're lucky if you work for a municipality or for the government. Um, you don't have to work and you still get paid. So no wonder that we are closing police stations and schools and, and even clinics because those people are not losing their money as the people in private do. Um, but that's an awkward thing to say now. But it's there, there is... For instance, on, on Salga, on the municipal uh, arrangements, there is a prolonged sick pay arrangement of many days, which uh, municipalities uh, have to pay out to employees working there. And then, of course, there may be contract provision that give extended rights to employees. Certain employees will, will, will have managed their contract in such a way that they've got additional sick pay. So if we can put this all into a final slide, um, and if I can just get the last bit of, of, of mental power that's still there so we can cl close this down nicely and so that everybody understands what is being said here. During full lockdown, there is no work by the employer. There's no work pr presentable by the employee, although the employee may present his or her work. So it's gonna be a no work, no pay. Uh, obviously, the covered policy of the employer can make arrangements from that, and a lot of employers were quite uh, benefactors in, in paying their employees for a, for a prolonged period of time. The covered arrangements fortunately gave the TERS fund, the TERS UIF fund, which um, uh, um, credit to who gets credit has really started to work quite well, and we must congratulate the government on, on, getting, on getting that part right. Um, and that same duty gets that same uh, um, that same benefit is available in the alert levels for those employees who still haven't come back to work. Vulnerable employees, a very important aspect. Those high risk vulnerable employees, multiple comorbidities and age. Those people that really, as doctors, we say you should not be out, not be in the shop, not be out of your home bubble, not be at work, not be in a taxi. We as doctors should stand up and, and book those people off sick and they should be getting the sick pay benefit um, as what we discussed just now. Obviously, the working from home policy could, could help in there too. And if there is a COVID policy on covering these people through early retirement or through other benefits, which can balance out the psychosocial risk of income with the biological risk of SARS-CoV-2, then that would be in, in their contract. And also for those, they are the TERS funds that can be claimed. A workplace acquired COVID-19 ill sick patient during illness will get occupational disease, temporary total disability. I, I, I raised on that being 75% of the wages for 30 days. 
um, paid by the employer and refunded by the fund to the employer. Um, not workplace acquired COVID ill person will get sick pay as that person is sick. So people in self-isolation should get benefit their full sick pay. Uh, workplace close contact self-quarantine, there the directive is clear that we have to get the same sick pay um, as for those that are sick. So that's for close contacts in the workplace. Private close contacts, you know, your, your wife is positive at home and that's you now close contact to your wife. That is unfortunately, an, as our law stands, a no work, no pay. And the employer can look at that in their COVID policy and maybe extend it in there. And high risk behavior, attending, uh, you know, attend, attending uh, illegal gatherings, as, as we see the pictures emerge, even our government officials seem to be doing this, that is a no work, no pay. If it's identified by the employer and the employer feels that it was a high risk, um, uh, high risk behavior, that person can be put into self-quarantine for 14 days and there will be a no work, no pay, unless there's a COVID policy covering this. So these are the eight different permutations as to why COVID would render employees being unable to work and the framework in which um, they can, remuneration can be paid. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And that was uh, Dr. Jan Napier, who is uh, uh, responsible for the remuneration of COVID-19 related employee absence from work and provided quite a lot of very useful information and a framework within which to understand all of the remuneration components provided either by the broader legal framework of labor legislation but also within the context of contract law and the contract of employments that are applicable. And um, yes, uh, bazookas have come out as he indicated, and uh, we hope that those uh, huge um, stimulus sort of inputs from the national government point of view would have the effect it, it has, it's supposed to have in supporting us. We certainly need to strengthen our public health system as well. Okay, so at this point, um, I need to give you some reminders with regard to um, the uh, administration. Uh, of this before I move over to uh, the thanks of uh, especially my colleagues um, who has contributed to today's session, um, including our presenters. So if I could just get this right this time, because I seem to have some difficulty in sharing my screen. So I'm just going to quickly do this. My colleague Glenn has given me some um, advice via the, okay, so uh, I've got to now share, right, good. So, and that means I'm sharing this one, which is already maximized. And I hope, Glenn, I've got it right this time around. So, um, if I could just quickly run through that and get this chat out of my way. Um, so I may need to move it over here, isn't it? Um, so Glenn, I'm hoping that what you're seeing there is in fact the full um, uh, screen. You can just maybe unmute your microphone for a moment to guide me. Um, is that the full screen that you see? Yes, it's a full screen. It's fine, sir. Thank you. And do I change? Do I just move it here on the other version? No, it doesn't seem to move there. Right. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm um, quickly. The program as we've had it um, was Dr. Tanusha Singh, um, the head of the COVID-19 outbreak response team, doing the welcome, and then the Vitz Health Consortium, our partner in this particular program. Um, with the support of the Health and Welfare CETA, providing the financial resources was Ms. Janine Roper, who's a training manager at the Vitz Health Consortium. And then our four presenters, uh, and much thanks to them. Um, that's Dr. Sayuri Pillay, who is now based here at the NIH um, and also associated with the School of Public Health at the Wits University uh, Medical Campus. Um, so 
So Dr. Sayuri Pillay dealt with the medical screening for COVID-19. Many thanks for her. And a reminder to those who've asked these questions in the chat group, yes, all these presentations will be available on the NIH website, as I've indicated, and we'll remind you now with a slide. And that website is zero rated, meaning you will not be charged any data when you visit the NIH website um, by any of the internet service, sorry, the mobile service providers providing you with access to the internet and an internet service provider as well. Our second uh, presenter was Sister Ida Jordan, Jordan, apologies, um, who's also an NIH uh, colleague of mine, um, who's based at the NICD uh, Sandringham campus here in Johannesburg. And Sister Jordan dealt with contact tracing, reporting, and notification. Thank you very much for your contribution. And then our third presenter was Dr. Nick van der Water, who dealt with the quarantine and isolation. Thank you very much for your contribution, um, Nick. And then finally, uh, Dr. Jan Lapierre, who dealt with remuneration for COVID-19 related employee absence from work. So there is a contract of employment between the employer and the employee. How does COVID-19 affect that relationship insofar as the normal terms of conditions with regard to presenting for work? And uh, he's dealt with a whole range of categories of the uh, uh, benefits and rights and responsibilities linked to them. So at this point in time, I've, I've thanked all of them. I need to then quickly um, move to a reminder of the certificates of attendance for this particular session as part of our partnership with the Witzel Consortium. And thank you to the hardworking team, the admin team at Witzel Consortium. You can email them at hwstraining at witzel.co.za. That is HWS training at witzelf.co.za. And then that also relates to any uh, data related questions you might have for them. Um, they will be, um, uh, what, what can I move this on here? Okay. Okay, so this one's not moving. Um, next, there we go, I figured it out. So um, with regard to CPD certificates and online multiple choice questionnaire process, please be reminded not to email us immediately at info at nih.ac.za. Allow us some time just to design and finalize the design of this questionnaire because we need to also incorporate all of those of you who have confirmed to have attended the session today and that record is only generated after this webinar is completed. And within that period, you will receive a link and this is only applicable to those who do belong to professional bodies. Not all of us belong to professional bodies where CPT points are applicable. And the list there is what is accredited. We are still working on the remainder of the list and the other requests received from our attendees. Um, and then with regard to the presentations, many questions were asked about this. Please be reminded that these presentations are on the NIH website. It is zero rated and we have the email address there, the Twitter handle and the hotline. Okay, so I need to then move on um, to the thank yous and complete that. So to my colleagues, and I hope I have covered all of them, um, I just need to make sure that that is the case. Um, uh, now, at the moment, I have this challenge that I can't see everybody. There we go. Okay, so my Zoom skills is getting a little bit sharper. Um, the persons that are not listed there, and I don't have time now to fix my slide, is Dr. Tanusha Singh, obviously. Um, we also have um, uh, Ketsi Singh, um, I think it's Claudia, um, as well as... Um, yeah, we, I think we had earlier another colleague uh, that was uh, Jeanette Mangani. So thank you very much to the NIH panelists for their contribution in uh, dealing with the questions. Dr. Red Valmik in the occupational medicine section, Dr. Mpume Nompumbelelo Daba, also occupational medicine, Dr. Mullen Mungombo, occupational medicine. And um, thank you to uh, Mullen for coordinating and putting all of this together. Thank you very much for all you having done that hard work and Dr. Sayuri Pillay also from Occupational Medicine. And now I have this uh, incomplete slide where um, our colleague Anna is from the Immunology and Microbiology section. 
that is headed by Dr. Tanusha Singh and um, Karan Dupree is from the occupational hygiene section. Thank you very much to all of my colleagues. And then to end off, um, thank you to all of you. Um, you do know that your next step is to click that leave button at the bottom and see you on our next webinar brought to you by the NIH team. That slide is also a work in progress. And that's where we end this session today. And we look forward to you responding to the invitations we will circulating for the COVID-19 webinars brought to you by the NIH um, Zoom team. And at that point, I say thank you and goodbye.